appreciate your continued attendance and support as we work through our housing challenges in the city. Uh, we are joined here tonight by a number of uh, electeds and appointed our community housing committee as well as a number of staff. Um, so they, you should have um, a staff member or a committee member at each of your tables to help facilitate your exercise tonight. And I'm going to use my cheat sheet so that I can introduce folks and ask that uh, you stand up as I introduce you. Um, so I don't want to miss anyone. Starting with uh, our city manager, Mr. David McKillian is back here in the back of the room. Uh, Barbara Nelson, our planning and director, building director is here in the back of the room. We've got Mark Themig, our community services director. Raina Allen, our administrative specialist. We've got a number of community services staff helping us tonight. And then Josie Gay, our community outreach coordinator. Our hardworking community housing committee is also here. Chair John Warden. Thank you, John. Uh, Mayor Tom Chambers, if he's floating around someplace. Councilwoman Bridgette Mansell. Thank you, Bridgette. Uh, Jeff Sivian is here. Raise your hand. Hi, Jeff. Joe Lickey. Bruce Abramson. And then finally, Nancy Medeiros. We also have a number of our housing partners here tonight. Uh, in the back of the room, we have Colleen Householder from NSCS. Uh, we, and uh, Colleen is helping us with translation tonight, so if anyone needs assistance there, I know we've identified a few folks. Um, we have those services available to help. Uh, and I know Dev Gouches tried to sneak in without being identified. She's here from the Housing Land, Land Trust. So welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, this, as I said earlier, this is a continuing discussion of our housing needs in our community. We appreciate you coming and continuing to participate in this uh, discussion. I think we have a fun and an interactive exercise for you tonight, um, and hopefully we can get some good feedback and correspondence. So at this point, I'm going to introduce the infamous Jim Hyde from Urban Green and let him take over. Thank you, Karen. Is, is that a good infamous or a bad infamous? I'm not sure which one. Okay, well, welcome everybody. It's great to see, uh, first of all, such a big group. We were hoping for 100 people and we may be pretty close to it, so that's good. Thank you for taking time on a Thursday night and coming to join us. Um, this is a really important meeting tonight, so I'm glad we have so many people. It looks like we've got a number of new people here too. So how many people have not been to one of these before? Okay, great, great. So thank you for coming. Uh, obviously, the rest of you have all been coming to these for the past, and I'm going to say this, 24 months. We've actually been at this for two years, which I know a lot of people are rolling their eyes and saying, why does it take so long? But as you will learn tonight, this is an incredibly complex issue. It's probably the number one challenge the state is facing across all its communities. And um, as I work throughout the state and around the country, uh, I think you should take great pride in knowing that the city is doing an amazing job of trying to tackle this. They are, they are approaching this in a way that a lot of other places have not thrown the same kind of energy and resources and thinking at. Now, I know a lot of people are saying, but where are the solutions? And that's part of where we're going tonight. We're trying to get to the solutions, uh, and that will be a lot of the conversation tonight. Uh, tonight is a conversation. It's first and foremost, it's a discussion. It's a chance for each of you to learn more about the complexities of this ch challenge, uh, to maybe open your minds from some of the uh, agendas or uh, very specific viewpoints that you have and maybe hear some of the other viewpoints. And along the way, collectively, we will find a solution. Um, this is not the last meeting. This is not where you've got to draw a line in the sand and say it's got to be this way. Uh, we're really here to try and figure out how to get to the holy grail, which is uh, managed growth, maintaining the character of the town, and um, achieving affordability for everybody that wants to live in this town has a dignified, wonderful place to live. We're going to do this in three parts tonight. Um, how many of you were here uh, almost a year ago in March when we did the little electronic polling? It was kind of fun, wasn't it? So we're going to actually start tonight with a polling. You know, those of you that haven't seen this, you'll get to see the magic of this. But I want to start with that because it's a very, without, before we do any discussion or any conversation about this, because I want to take the pulse of what is the mood of the group right here on some key issues related to housing. So we're going to open with that. 
And then I'm going to do a bit of a presentation to talk about what we have learned and what are some of the key issues related to the housing challenge we face in Healdsburg. And as I've said before, and I'm going to say several times tonight, this is terribly complex. Uh, it's very much interconnected. All of the solutions, there's no single solution. There's a number of multiple entry points and things you have to work through. So we've tried to keep this fairly simple and high level. So I'm going to ask you to just, when we get to that part, you've got to listen very carefully, take good notes. And then the bulk of the meeting will be this game board that you have in front of you, which is kind of a fun game that we will do to start to facilitate the conversation, but actually have you as a group start to sort through some of the numbers and the implications of what we do with growth and how growth translates into housing and how housing translates into different kinds of housing for different households. Um, a couple of housekeeping things. There is a lot of paper on your table, so just to give you a quick tour, you have an exit survey. These are really helpful if you can just kind of put this aside, but make sure you turn this in before you leave. It's a good way for us to gauge whether this was successful, what you heard that was helpful, what worked, what didn't work. There is a little brochure here called Housing Our Community. This is a summary of the series that we did literally a year ago to start this conversation and provide a baseline of information and education to the community about housing. So if you haven't looked at this, this is a good way to maybe catch up on what were some of the key things that are forming the conversation, and it's a great intro to what we're doing tonight. There is a sheet called Housing Types, and this will be an important part of your game. This helps define what are the kinds of housing we're talking about, and you will actually be discussing and selecting uh, M&Ms. I said that right, M&Ms to indicate the different kinds of uh, housing. And then there is the game board, and we'll talk about the game board. So, um, so does everybody have a polling device? Um, one footnote about the polling device caveat. Really important you turn that back in when you leave because otherwise the company that rents them to us charges us an arm and a leg. So we need to get them all back because it's not a very good use of city resources to pay for. And it won't do you any good. It won't, you can't use it to change your TV channels or anything. So. Okay, so what we're going to do, the way this works is you got the polling device. I'm going to put up a slide here with a list of questions. You'll have a few seconds to kind of pick and... Not a long deliberation. Go with your gut instinct. This is just, we're just trying to get a sense of where people are at this moment in time on a various set of issues related to growth and housing. Uh, and then you will see the results real time. And that's also going to be really helpful for me because it's going to help me understand how hard I got to work during the presentation. Or if you already have this all figured out, we can just move right to the game. So, uh, Raina, if I go forward, we're going to be good, right? Okay. So this is an easy one. This is a little bit of a warm up to make sure you've got the, the technique down. So this is, and it's really um, an important question. We want to know, you know, why are people here? Yes, housing's the issue. Yes, we know we got some great food and everybody came to see all the fun games and eat M&Ms, but why are you here? What's the main thrust of it? So there's a couple of things, I don't know how well you can read this. You will be selecting the letters on the, on the, on the, uh, the handheld there. So A is, I wanted to learn more about the proposed changes to the growth management ordinance, the GMO. Second one is, I am concerned about the lack of affordable housing in our community. Third one is, I'm concerned about the lack of housing that can be purchased by middle income housings in our community. We're gonna be defining that later, but just think about middle income housing. Uh, I'm concerned that our community is losing its diversity. I'm concerned that our community is losing its character and I am here for reasons other than those listed above. Okay, so hit your buttons. Let's have the Jeopardy music. We'll do about uh, 15 seconds here. Oh, sorry. One. We'll have a couple where you can do multiple, but not this one. All right, are we done? Everybody's in? Okay. So, uh, good. A lot of people came to hear about the GMO, which is a big issue, and actually it was, was the big takeaway from our session a year ago. Uh, a lot of people here are concerned about affordable housing in our community. Great. So that's, that's going to be a big part of the conversation. Uh, lack of housing for middle income, 
uh, concern about the community losing its diversity, and then not as much about character and other reasons. Um, okay, we're going to go on. Be interesting. Those of you that came for other reasons, I don't want to take time now, but if you wouldn't mind coming up and telling me some point this evening why you're here, it would be good to know that. All right, we're going to go to the next one. Yeah, can we can we dim the lights back there? Okay, so. Um, it's a little bit of a poll where, we, where we've come in 12 months. So the question is, how has our housing situation, you can interpret that however you mean, would like here, if you're here for affordable housing, it's about affordability, it's about what's happening, et cetera. How has our housing situation changed since last year? It's gotten much worse. It's about the same as last year. It's gotten better. It's not as big an issue as everyone makes it out to be or none of the above. Okay. More in 61. Like we had about 68 last time. Is that it? Everybody put in their vote. Okay. So that's uh, that's a big call to action. Half the group feels it's uh, gotten worse. Okay. So we'll we'll talk about and as you do your group breakouts tonight, it would be interesting to talk about what do you think has gotten worse about it. Maybe it's just the obvious that there isn't as much affordable or prices have risen. But if there's some things behind that that you want to talk about. We're going to want to record those because that will be helpful. Okay, let's keep moving along here. Keep the energy up. Next one. If I can advance it. Okay, how would you characterize the city's efforts to address that housing challenge? What we just talked about. Good efforts, but I'm not sure they're going to work. Lots of good effort. I think it will make a difference over time. A lot of talk, but I don't see any real changes proposed. I see progress in addressing the challenge, and I really don't know enough of what's going on to be able to evaluate it. Okay, hit it. Okay, so I can tell I've got a lot of work to do tonight. I'm, I'm sitting here watching the Zumba class over there, and I'm looking at that middle bar, and I'm thinking I'm going to go over there. Um, okay, so C, a lot, of people, a lot of talk, but I don't see any real changes proposed. So part of the conversation then when we get to the next part is for me to at least communicate what those changes are that are being proposed. Uh, and then hopefully as you talk at your tables, those people that have been involved in the conversation can share what's being, uh, what's being proposed. You may still feel like that's not enough, but I can tell you there is a lot of stuff being done right now, and all of this takes a long time, so unfortunately. But we are in California where everything takes inordinately long. Uh, all right, next one. Okay. So we're going to move forward from looking back and talking about all the problems. Let's talk a little bit more. Let's be a little more positive. What would we like to see? And so one of the things that we are doing, one of the big changes we are doing is we are taking what has traditionally been a very policy-oriented subject, housing, which sits within the general plan and has a lot of great aspirational statements, and we are right in the midst of crafting what's called a housing action plan, which is very specific about the tools and the targets of what we want to achieve in a certain period of time relative to housing. So part of that is setting up a set of priorities. What are the priorities? And so what we'd like to hear from people right now is, what do you think the priorities in that action plan should be? And the first one is build more affordable housing, build more middle income housing. So this is, the, this is that group uh, above affordable but below market rate. Build greater diversity of housing types, build more rental apartments, build more seniors housing, encourage private homeowners to build more secondary dwelling units or granny flats, as some people may know them, reduce the impacts of second home community ownership on the community, build new development to respect our small town character and none of the above. So where are we? <laughs> no, you just pick the one that's the top priority in your mind. Uh, 
Uh, I guess that's correct. Okay, are we there? Uh, still coming in? All right. So there we have it again, affordable housing as the top priority. Um, interesting. Uh, and again, this is the top, so it doesn't mean, but this is, a, this is an important list because this is something that has been evolving over the last six months through the Community Housing Committee and the development of the Housing Action Plan process. So we've kind of worked through, these were some of the priorities that were identified as our objectives. And, um, and we've, so it's good to kind of get the community's feedback on are your prior, what are the priorities relative to that list. Um, the, uh, the issues of affordable housing are always at the top. Uh, greater diversity of housing is something that we talked a lot about last March, and that will be a big part of the game exercise tonight. Um, Encouraging private homeowners to build secondary dwelling units or granny flats, that's another piece of it, and uh, the middle income housing. Uh, not, interestingly, not uh, a lot of emphasis or not a prioritization, at least at the top, for seniors housing, which is consistent with some of the conversations we've had at other public meetings. Not saying that seniors don't want to be able to live here, but they don't want to live in isolated communities where they're just, they're, they're uh, isolated from the community. So, um, and, um, okay. We will go on to the, I think the last one here. Oh, okay. So Robert, to your, who asked this question, we're gonna do the same thing again. This is your second priority. So if we did the first one, yes. Ah. Um, uh, that's part two of the conversation, so if you can just hold that. I realize, I realize it makes it hard to answer this, but I know, but the, the, just I'm trying to get the level of understanding now, so we will, we will go there uh, in a minute. Okay, so, so this is again, so you did your top priority, now you get a chance to go again. Okay, great. So very interesting in the sense that the two themes that have been consistent in every workshop that we have done all the way back to uh, February of 2014 have been these two, and I wouldn't say they're competing themes, they're, they're kind of related themes. One is the affordability of housing, but the other is great, getting a greater diversity of housing options into the community because it allows us to maintain the diversity of our community, which is something I'll talk about later that everybody said is an important attribute and quality of what makes us unique. So very strong preference for diversity. Um, building more rental apartments, uh, that's gonna be interesting because we, it's been a lot of discussion uh, about this over the years, and I think it's recognized um, that the challenge that we've got with rental pricing is there has no, been no significant rental apartments built in the community since about 1995. And so basic laws of supply and demand. Um, at a time when the national demographics and families and households and stuff are looking to rent more. So the whole idea of single family ownership is actually changing dramatically. A lot of people are looking more to rent. We have less supply, we haven't built a lot. So how do we do that? So another, another big priority and then uh, building more affordable housing. So we're gonna be kind of tabulating all of this and cross-referencing, uh, waiting to see where we ended up, but that's great information. I think we have one more, is that right, Raina? Do you remember? We have one more. Okay, so this is, this, is, uh, this is another part of the understanding. So what are the biggest barriers to meeting our housing goals by 2022? And 2022 sounds like an odd number, that's six years out, um, more or less, but it's, a, it's going to be the time frame that we will be talking about tonight. We've, we've been, and I'll explain the process, but all of the housing action plan is directed towards what do we want to achieve relative to housing by the year 2022? So, uh, so what are the barriers? Lack of funding for affordable housing, lack of leadership, lack of affordable land on which to build new housing, lack of creativity, unwillingness to accept higher density housing, different, community, or different housing types, 
growth limits that drive up land costs, out-of-date regulations and high fees, and none of the above. Okay, I think that actually got the highest number of responses, 71. All right, uh, some more work to do. Uh, lack of leadership on the issue. So this will be interesting tonight to hear, I think, again, as you're reporting out and you're talking, um, what kinds of leadership do you think we are missing beyond what's already going on? And I realize maybe there's a lot of people who are not familiar with all the work that's being done, so hopefully this will be a chance to at least uh, share that with you, but um, it would be interesting to know. It's, there's always things that come out of these that uh, we've never thought of. So hopefully there will be some ideas that people will have about other places for leadership that can be brought to the to solving the problem. Okay, uh, with that, uh, Raina, I think this is we're done with the polling. We're going to jump to the presentation. Is that right? And close that. I'll look at that. Okay. Thank you. So um, the goal will be to get through this in about 20 minutes. So if you bear with me, a lot of information. If you have a place where you want to take a note or two, a piece of paper in front of you, I would suggest there's some key things. Somebody asked about how do you define affordable housing. Uh, I talked a lot about middle income housing. People said they don't really see any changes. I want to talk a little bit about some of the changes. Um, I cannot possibly condense in 20 minutes all that's gone on in 16 months, but I will try to give you the highlights and the key terms so that as you talk at your tables, you can learn more. And there are a number of us around here that can answer questions as you get into your group discussions. So, so let's do this. Uh, first of all, I wanted to talk just to give you a little bit of context um, for whether it's a question of you don't think there's leadership or you don't think a lot has been done, what has actually been done. So in 2014, there was a whole series of community workshops around what is called our housing element. It's a state mandated part of our general plan. It's something every community has to do every four years, uh, now every eight years. And it requires a series of outreach discussions, looking at housing numbers and showing the ability or the capacity to create new affordable housing in the community. And it's a, one of those things that you have to do, but through the process you learn some good information about the community. And uh, I think the city was very um, progressive in its thinking in terms of the way that they did this. There are a lot of communities that just behind closed doors change the numbers and send it off to the state and the state blesses it. The city had these workshops, we had a lot of discussions and I think one of the big takeaways from that session, those sessions was the people, the good people that came, we had about 30 at every session, is there was a growing sense of frustration that it was very much policy oriented and it was about having capacity, i.e. we had land zoned for density for affordable housing, but there weren't any specific actions and that led to the idea of the action plan. So in January of last year, uh, at the mayor's request and the council's request, we embarked on a series of educational sessions on housing. We did an opening one in January called Housing 101. What does it cost to build a house? What are the things that cause housing to be so expensive? What is the process by which um, housing in our community has been built? And what is the impact of certain policies that have been made over the years and what have been the consequences of those? 
We did a community forum, which was a panel discussion. We brought in some developers and some affordable housing architects. Uh, and then we did a workshop, which was the one with the Legos. How many people were here for the Lego exercise? It's a good group of you. The big thing that came out of that session was the growth management ordinance that we had, as it was currently written, well-intended document that had really kind of outlived its life in the times that we're in now, it needed to be updated. Uh, very complicated process, complicated document, requires a general election ballot measure, et cetera, et cetera. So in June, a uh, committee was formed, the Community Housing Committee, the members are here, to look at how we might revise the language in the Growth Management Ordinance to maintain the intent of managing the growth of the community, maintaining our character, but allow and remove some of the impediments that were causing the basic limits of uh, supply and demand. Limited number of homes get built. The only thing that gets built are big homes that cost a lot of money and they're not very affordable. So that was done in August, September through November. We had about, uh, we had a number of work sessions twice a month. Number of people came to those, provided a lot of good input, helped with the thinking. We had an open house in October where we brought a lot of people into here. We kind of shared what the emerging things were. And in December, the council received the recommendations on how to change what we think the ballot measure should include. Um, in uh, this year, then, we, the Community Housing Committee continues its work. Now that the ballot measure has been crafted and is going through the fine legalese and environmental review, we're now moving to the Housing Action Plan, which is what this meeting is about tonight. Uh, there was community polling done to see if there was uh, still interest in modifying the Growth Management Ordinance, and it was fairly significant. I think about 67% of the community felt that there needed to be some changes made. Um, and then February, we are here with this community workshop. There will be two more community sessions each month. One will be uh, another panel where we'll have some developers come in and talk about what does it take to do affordable housing. And then the other one will, uh, will be focused, it will be an open house where we'll share where the action plan is going. So again, a lot of meetings, 25 meetings between now and the end of this process in 24 months, a lot more than a lot of people can attend, although many people have made it to every one um, but it shows a little bit, I think, the earnestness uh, and the sincerity that's going on to make this thing happen. People may not feel like it's enough, but there has been a lot of effort. Let's put it that way. Okay, so through all of that process, I wanted to talk about three things. And the first one is, what have we learned about growth? Because the issue last year was predominantly about growth. If we're going to change the growth management ordinance, which is, that's the name of it, because it's meant to manage growth, what does the community feel about growth? How do we want to grow? And there were a couple things that came out of that. We did a very similar exercise to this. And the first one was we asked people what was the relationship or what was, what was it about Healdsburg? What were the best indicators of a high quality of life? We all live here for a particular reason. And it's a lot, I think, a lot of people because it's a unique quality of life. So how would you recognize that quality of life? And the things that came up again, time and again Wide range of ages, ages of people that live in our town, diversity of families that live in our town, and having a variety of residential options that I can afford. Almost, uh, what is that there, 67, 77% um, are things, those blue wedges all tied to housing. So the issues about quality of life are largely tied or have a direct relationship to housing, why we're having this conversation tonight. The second thing, so this is an exercise that we did at one of the recent community housing committee meetings where we had everybody that was in attendance, the committee members, but there are also about 12 people who came from the community. We had them write a specific objective for the next six years. And then we took all of the words that were in those objectives and we ran them through the Wordle process, which takes the number, of the, if a word shows up, Several times it, it gets a bigger lettering. So the word that shows up the most is the biggest. Housing being the one on there makes sense. But diversity and affordability, again, very consistent with what we saw in the polling numbers, top of people's concern, and actually diversity being the most important and the most frequent word that showed up again. How do we maintain the diversity of this community? A big part of that is achieving more affordable housing. The third thing that came out of March was, if you remember, we presented a series of growth scenarios that started with, we just stay, we keep everything the same, we don't change anything. Another one that said, we try to direct growth in a way that is more almost surgical infill, diverse housing types that goes into the neighborhoods, small scale. And then the third one is more directed growth. We identify what it is we need and we go to those larger sites that haven't been developed yet and we try to direct it there. And, what, and this was done, like tonight, we did this before any conversation. What was really, I thought, was a big takeaway and a shocking to this was 
that 91% of the people chose the two growth scenarios. They were ready for some form of growth, managed growth, not just rampant growth, but managed growth that was not occurring in the community and that we needed to deal with that if we were going to maintain diversity and if we were going to get to a point where we could get to more affordability. So those were the kind of the big takeaways from our series last year and discussions about growth and where the community, I think what was important to the community. So since uh, the, that point, we kind of got through the growth management ordinance, as I said, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how that will work, what is going to be on the ballot this fall, and it's really important that everybody in this room understand this so you can make an informed decision when you step in the ballot box. But we've moved from the issue of growth then to housing because housing is a big part of the growth. There's commercial growth, but there's housing growth, and that's the thing that obviously is why everybody's here. So this is, the, this is the meaty part, and this is the part where you need to take good notes. So first of all, along with the objectives that we outlined for the Housing Action Plan, we took all that we'd learned and we wrote a vision, which is still a work in process. This is probably the eighth generation of it, but it basically draws on all the things that we've heard from the various community meetings and from the Community Housing Committee. And it says, looking out to 2022, which is this window of time that we are looking to to try and direct our housing products, that Healdsburg is a diverse, thriving community evidenced by a wide diversity of housing both type and price. So you've got the diversity of housing options and we've got affordability across multiple scales. I won't bore you by reading the rest of it, but it's really saying people can live in neighborhoods that are active and welcoming and really that the neighborhoods are part of what makes this community unique. It's not just a bunch of housing randomly around town. There are very unique neighborhoods that people are very proud to be a part of and we want to maintain that neighborhood quality. So that's kind of the background, but the three things to take home from tonight are this. How we maintain affordability going forward, because this is very important to the discussion, and there's a lot of confusion around the semantics, around affordability. So I'm going to try and clarify to the extent that I can what we're talking about tonight and what we can actually do. The second thing we're going to talk about are the tools that we have to create housing. And then the third thing is how the GMO would work. So first of all, how do we maintain affordability? So there's a very simple, very simple tried and true, tried and tested tool that's used all over the country. And it's basically with housing that is affordable. And affordable in this case is a term that is defined by the state and it's defined by the federal government and it's based on income categories. Um, and the way that you maintain that affordability is as that housing unit is built, um, it is deed restricted to only go to people that make that income within that income group. It can also be, um, we'll talk about this in the middle income, you can give a preference for people that work in town. You can give a preference for people that have lived in town for three years. So you don't build affordable housing. And then at one of the meetings, said, somebody said, well, if I live in Bakersfield, could I come up and move to Healdsburg? Uh, no, not right away, because there is a preference and obviously a long waiting list. So it goes, it's built in this town for people that live in this town and work in this town. And it can also be deed restricted by age. People that live in senior restricted or age restricted communities, the same process, it's a deed restricted community. The other thing is it establishes the property sale term. So when somebody buys an affordable house and they sell it at the end, they don't just get to market to market and get a windfall. They have to sell it to someone that's within that same income category. And therefore, the affordability is maintained for a very long time, if not in perpetuity. This is really, really important, because a lot of people that talk about, well, we're losing affordable housing in town because so-and-so used to rent my apartment for $900 and they just racked it, jacked it up to $1,200. That is not a deed-restricted house. That is a market rate house that is, it is affordable because somebody can rent it at an affordable rent, but it is not, by the terms that we're using tonight, an affordable housing unit. So very important to remember. Okay, see some nodding, so that's good. So I'm gonna move on to housing tools. So we have three types of, four types of housing tools, and this is, relates directly to your game board. Affordable housing. So affordable housing is deed restricted, I just talked about. It's income based in its location preference. And in Healdsburg, as of now, roughly for families of four, it's for people that earn, families that earn between zero and $96,000 a year. There's some other categories in there and it varies on the size of the house or the size of the family, but we don't need to get into those details. This is a good kind of benchmark way for you to think about it. The second kind of housing is the new housing that came out of all of our discussions last year, which uh, can be summarized like this. 
we have been pretty good at building affordable housing in this town. 8.2% of the housing stock in this community is deed restricted as affordable. Puts us right in the middle of all the North Bay communities. The best that anybody's achieved is about 11.5%. The worst is about 5%. So we're right in the middle. Could be better, but we're not doing too bad. Um, but what's happened is there are those that qualify, the, the, the uh, uh, 96,000 and less that qualify for the affordable housing, and there are those who are, you know, make a good enough living that they can buy what's on the market. What's happened is there are people who make too much to qualify for affordable housing and not enough to buy a median priced here in, uh, home here in town because of the cost of financing and what fi how financing underwrites. That, and that is people that work in a lot of the shops here, people that work in the restaurants, uh, teachers, uh, what we call the community service providers. And so there was a concern people that work at the um, hospital. Uh, the people that are really important to the character and the, 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 the nature of this community. So through a lot of back and forth about, oh, do you call it workforce housing, do you call it backbone housing, whatever, we came on this term middle income housing. And it's, so this would be a new housing type that is deed restricted, it's income based, it would be location preference, so for people that are working here in town, and employment preference. Uh, location preference being people that lived here roughly for three years or more, Loca employment preference, somebody working in town. It's right now, based on the analysis that was done by our economics firm, um, it would be for families that make 120% to 160% of what's called area median income. That translates to that range. That is what you would make. You could qualify for this housing. So it's going to be an important part of your game board tonight. Okay. The third thing, and I, and I will say, and I'll give credit to, there's a number of people that have come to every one of our meetings and have been uh, championing this idea, which is a good idea and it's gaining a lot of uh, movement across the North Bay, and it's the idea of the secondary dwelling unit, the granny flat, the accessory dwelling unit, you hear this term used all through California, and it's the idea of building a small unit in the back of your yard uh, that um, you know, your kids could live in, um, the boomerang kids that come back, they can't quite buy into town, but they want to live here. Uh, your, your parents could live there, you might want to live there and rent your house out as you get older. So it's a secondary dwelling unit, the state uh, mandates that cities cannot prohibit this. You actually, they actually are allowed to do this because the state recognizes this is a way to get housing that is more affordable, not get affordable housing. So I'll make that distinction. It's not, right now as it exists, it is privately built, it is not deed restricted, but it is affordable by design, simply meaning it's smaller, it has lower maintenance, um, people are building it, and uh, they can, there's really, in a lot of ways, no land costs associated with it, so it can be more affordable by design. So that's another piece of your game board. And this is just a quick little graphic, actually, from Cheyenne, Wyoming. He's doing some pretty interesting stuff with accessory dwelling units. This is just showing all the different ways that you could address um, secondary dwelling units on a lot. And then the last one is market rate housing. And this is, uh, in many ways, the flashpoint in the community, if I can say that, because all the meetings I've been to, this is the 800-pound gorilla in some ways, and it's also the nemesis of everybody that's concerned about affordable housing. And it is, there are no price restrictions on it, and there are no income limits. It's what the market will bear gets built and sold at the price. And we have all know of the story of the house two blocks over that just sold all cash for some ridiculous night number. That is market rate housing. Now, market rate housing is the only tool that creates affordable housing at limited or no cost to the city. So this is a very important part of the discussion tonight. Uh, there is a, there's a thing called the inclusionary housing ordinance. So when a developer builds a market rate house, either pays a fee, and if he builds seven houses, one of those houses has to be affordable. It has to be deed restricted, and it has to fulfill the income requirements, what I showed earlier, somebody, a family from zero to 96,000. So this is a very important tool. And of that, uh, of the housing that has been built in the community here, I would dare say that in, in the bulk of our uh, affordable housing that has been built in this community was built two and a half, or was built about a decade and a half ago, from 1990 to 2000, largely on the back of Parkland Farms when we were building market rate housing at great scale and they're also getting affordable housing out of that. So really important part of it, sensitive subject, that's why we're all here, we're going to talk about it tonight. 
And uh, just to underscore this point, because I think this is the disconnect, uh, that unfortunately it's the reality that we live in and we have to grasp this. So the Legislative Analyst Office of California has done a lot of work around why is the housing crisis in California a crisis. They go back, they look at 30 years of bad policy, of nimbyism, of environmental regulations, and they just came out this week with another report that kind of summarized the report they did last year. And what they said is... Uh, additional evidence of facilitating more private housing development in the state's coastal urban communities would help make housing more affordable for low-income Californians. It's basically supply and demand, and I'm not advocating, you know, opening the gates and flooding Hillsborough with housing, but there is a direct connect across all of the economists that the, the pinch point that we have put on housing development has created the affordability crisis that we've got. They also go on to say that expanding affordable housing programs to help those households likely would be extremely challenging and prohibitively expensive. I'm going to talk for a minute in a minute about the cost of this, but affordable housing, as it was done 10 years ago when there were big federal programs and there was money, there was redevelopment agency money, was a very different era than the era we're in right now. And that doesn't mean we can't solve this, but we can't just kind of all come together and sing kumbaya and say we're going to build a bunch of housing because there is a real cost and we've got to be creative about how we do that. And it's not the same solutions it was 10 years ago. Okay. Background, that's the housing tools. I'm going to talk about how the GMO works because the GMO is directly related to housing and housing production is directly related to affordability. I'm trying to connect all the dots here. So first of all, the big change with the housing, uh, with the growth management ordinance, people said they didn't see any changes. Here's change number one. The growth management ordinance as it exists right now lasts forever. It's in perpetuity. It is a number that was set in 2000, 30 units per year, 90 over three years, and that was it forever. There was no opportunity to review it. There was no opportunity to adjust it unless we went to the ballot box, which we will be doing in November, and it was not it was a very, uh, what uh, the Brookings Institute calls it, it was a growth control tool, not a growth management tool. It basically constrained the ability to manage growth. It just said, you either build it or you don't. So what this, this has done is it's tied, it's created the idea of a housing cycle that we take a window that is concurrent with the housing element, that state mandated document that provides some information but doesn't provide us a lot of action. And at the same time, we do a housing action plan we get the information out of the housing element, and we develop our actions like we're doing tonight. It provides an opportunity for review and adjustment. Anything that is dynamic as a housing market, you have to have the ability to review it, adjust, update. And so this provides a window to do that, but it does it in what I would call a Goldilocks time horizon, and that means it's not too short and it's not too long. Right now, the cycles uh, by which the Growth allocations, the GMO uses allocations for new housing, is three years. Well, you can barely get anything designed and built in three years. By then, the market shifts. So the idea was to have it long enough that you could actually work with the realities of real estate cycles, but not too long that you're creating a, a problem down the line, but also not so short that you can't, um, you know, you can't adjust to the realities of the market. So it's, and this was a number that we landed on that fit elegantly with the housing element. The second thing, and this is relatively consistent with where the growth manager, so I wouldn't say this is a big change, but it's been a big clarification. It limits growth within the community of Healdsburg to 1% per year. Now, that doesn't mean every year it's going to be 1%, but over that cycle that I just mentioned, the goal is that it's about 1% on an annualized basis. And where it does that is it takes the current number of housing units that we have in the community, market rate right now, 4504, and takes 1% of those. So for this next cycle that we'll be entering, it means we have 45 allocations per year. Does everybody know what an allocation is? Don't see a lot of hands. Okay, so let me try and explain this. So, so the allocation is really, it's, it's the, in a lot of ways, it's the currency that the community has created to create housing. And so if I am a developer and I want to build five units within this cycle, I have to go get five allocations. And so as it worked right now, in any given year, there were only 30 allocations available, which meant you could only build roughly 30 units a year. Now, you could get an allocation one year and build the homes the next year, so it wasn't exactly along those lines, but that was the idea. So the allocation is the gateway to building a new house. You still have to get a building permit, but it's the currency that the community uses, and it's a very important tool in the communities that have it because you can negotiate and get things that you want, and that's going to be a very important part of our conversation tonight. So for this next cycle, 
mentioned that we have this housing cycle that tracks with the housing element. We have 45 allocations per year, and because this cycle is six years long, which is another long story that I won't bore you with, but just trust me, it's six years long, that means we have 270 allocations. And what, what's the other big change uh, that came out of this is right now those allocations were only available at the start of every three-year cycle. In this scheme, all of those allocations come forward. And the reason that's important is, and the reason that we don't have a lot of multifamily new housing built in the community is you can't build a cost-effective 40-unit rental building if you can only get 30 allocations per year and 10 of them are going to go to single-family homes and 10 of them are going to go somewhere else. So nobody builds market rate rental housing. It just, you can't do it. You can't go to the bank and get a loan. So what this does is it limits it to 1% growth, but it creates that currency at the beginning. So if somebody wants to do 40 units of middle income housing, middle income rental apartments, they can get those at the beginning, then plan over that cycle and build it out. So very, very important tool, not changing the growth uh, rate, but changing uh, the access that the housing developers have to build more housing in keeping with the community's wishes. Okay, the last part of this. If it, is everybody totally confused now? Okay, you're doing good, we're doing good? Okay, so good, so then this is the next thing. So we have 270 allocations over the next six years, and all we're talking about is the next six years, okay? So you, one of the things you're gonna do tonight is you're gonna take those 270 allocations, which will be represented by color M&Ms, and you're going to distribute them into the different product types. We have, in the current recommendation, this idea of directed allocations and open allocations. And the idea of a directed allocation, back to this notion that this is a currency that the community has created to negotiate with developers, you might say, we would really like to see more market rate rental apartments. So let's put 50 of those allocations as directed allocations that will only go to market rate rental apartments. What that means is if a developer's out there and he says, boy, I know I can get that approved and I can get those allocations, I'm gonna step up and I'm gonna do that quicker. Or I'm going to do middle income housing units. It's a way to give a signal to the market that this is what the community really wants and it gives an incentive for the development community to build what the community wants. Because what are the two things that communities and developers both want? Does anybody know? Money. Money. <laughs> Certainty. Developer wants to know it can, if it puts a project on the table, they can get it approved. The community wants to know that what gets built, where it gets built, is what they would like to see. So ironically, people don't realize this, developers and communities both want the same things. Unfortunately, we end up going at it from different ends. So uh, the idea of the directed allocations is to provide some certainty that the community will get what it wants, and the developers have the certainty that this is what the community wants and therefore I can probably get this approved much faster. Obviously it has to look good and it has to meet all the income requirements, et cetera, et cetera, but that's the way to do that. So directed versus open allocation. Open would be market rate. So it's a first come, first serve. Um, and so it's what we have now. Right now are basically open allocations. There is nothing in those 30 allocations per year that tells the market what the community wants. Above market or above middle? Above well, market market would be the mar so the let me put it this way the median. Oh, okay. So the median income so 160 percent would be able to purchase the median priced income home, which last year when we did the analysis was like 680 thousand uh, dollars. I think it was about 2,800 dollars a month, and again, it depends on size and everything else. So. I'm sorry, I'm going to, just because I want to make sure I get you out of here as promised, we'll do some questions uh, maybe during the discussion, but we've got a little bit more to go. So, um, okay. Another really important part of the GMO, and this is really, really critical because everybody gets confused, is that growth management ordinance regulates certain kinds of housing. It does not regulate other kinds of housing, which means the allocations do not apply to the unregulated units. So, GMO, as proposed, will only apply to market rate housing, which we just talked about, thank you, Todd, and middle income housing, that 120 to 160 range. The exempt are affordable housing, 
what we talked about, that, that stuff that is deed restricted affordable and secondary dwelling units. By state law, you cannot regulate the development of those in terms of any kind of a growth management tool. So tonight, you're going to see two parts on your game board. One is above the line. That is all the regulated, the market rate in the middle income units. And below the line are those that are exempt. But there is a connection, and that connection is the market rate, should you choose to build market rate housing, will build, will yield affordable housing. Okay. I'm going to take a breath for a second. Let that sink in. Um, so what are we doing tonight? Now we're, now we're on to the fun part. Hopefully that provided enough of uh, the key things that you need to know. You'll learn a lot more as we go through the process tonight. And again, there's no quiz at the end of this. Uh, there's no right and wrong answers. We're trying to both, first of all, create community conversation, and secondly, uh, cre really create more understanding about th this. So what we're doing tonight will provide a lot of input for the Community Housing Committee and how we shape the priorities that go into the housing action plan that I just spoke about. And, by, and what it will do, the way it's going to do that, is it will start to give us a sense of what are the targets how many units of what kind would the community like to be see built in this next cycle? So that's really the goal. And we're not going to, again, tonight is not the night that we're going to decide how many units each one, but it'll start to give us a sense of what are the, the priorities in the community, like we did at the early polling. Okay, so roundtable exercise. You're all going to sit with your group. We're going to take about 45 minutes to go through this exercise. And at the end of it, you're going to report something back. So first of all, the, the main part of this is not what you report back but to have a good discussion and that everybody learns something from each other and learns about the process. The second one is to identify the priorities that the community would like to see relative to housing beyond those big swaths that we took at the beginning. You know, we want affordable housing, we want market rate housing. We've got to get a little more fine grain than that. And also, hopefully along the way, I hope people begin to understand the challenges and why uh, if you feel there hasn't been a lot of progress or there's a lack of leadership, you start to understand what the challenges are. And then you may have some new ideas about, okay, how should we be addressing that? So you have uh, three things in front of you, and uh, let's see, Raina, okay, you're going to start passing out the goodies, right? Uh, okay, so you have a game board in front of you, so if you have that, um, it looks like we've got pretty well-balanced tables, so I don't think we need to redistribute, but I would suggest you start to clear that off of stuff, because you need to look at it, and you guys might want to turn it so you can all look at it a little bit better. Uh, yes, you are. Hang on to your polling devices, please. We will have one more round at the end. You can stack them up or whatever. Just don't lose them. Don't lose them in the mess of stuff. Okay. So turn the game board so that you can see it. And the game board's role is it really to help create the discussion. It's a way to kind of, you know, there's something very tactile about putting stuff on it. But the goal is to test future scenarios about what you would like to build. So, so the next thing you're getting is cupfuls of M&Ms. Everybody with me? Class? Class? Stay with me here. I don't want to lose you. Okay. So you have M&Ms, and we didn't hand them out ahead of time because we didn't want people eating them because they're, they are your housing units. So if you eat them all, you have no housing to distribute. Okay. So, you, so really important. Each M&M equals how many housing units? Okay, good. That's really important. So don't like put them, you don't say, oh, I'm short 100, 100 M&Ms. Let's shade them. Five, they count as five. That's a pretty good, okay. And the color coding is explained on the board. So um, there is a different color M&M for each type of housing. The other thing you'll see on the board are some big numbers. Those numbers are what the community already has of those different housing types. So you can see we have a lot of one kind. We don't have a lot of some others. We have none of the others. So this is a way, if you think about this as almost Sim City, you are six years from now beginning to figure out where we would add, not physically where we would add, but by kinds of housing, where we would add housing units by type. And then the third thing that you should have are worksheets. So everybody see this thing? It says discussion notes, and then there's a reporting out sheet, which I think is on the back side, on the back side here. So at the end of the evening, you are going to count up your M&Ms, and you're going to fill in the boxes. So I would suggest once we break here, you should identify somebody as a reporter who just kind of is going to feed back what you learned. Somebody as a recorder who will write down what you're talking about and some of the big ahas. 
and then, um, and then you can just kind of work through the conversation. I'll explain the exercise in a minute, but just be thinking about when we start to go into the exercise, somebody can either self-appoint themselves, don't spend a whole evening trying to figure out who it's going to be, just take the charge. But we need to fill out those worksheets because that's the really important piece that we take home from this. Okay, we're down to the last two slides. Pay attention. This is how this works. So it's really important for you. Everybody with me? Okay, so part one, above the line, the orange boxes. What types of housing do we need? Not, not, not affordable versus market. This is what types of housing do we need? So we've got single family detached. We've got single family attached, multifamily, live, work, mixed use, cottage courts. Those types are explained on that other sheet. So if you're not familiar with them, there's a little bit of explanation. You can take... 54 M&Ms, which equals 270, and you need to distribute those over those boxes. Now, you also need to just divide it a little bit smaller in terms of red M&Ms are the so-called market rate homes, and pink M&Ms are the middle income. So you may say we need, we need 50 cottage courts in this town, but we'd like half of them to be cottage, uh, middle income and half of them to be market rate. So you put five and five of each color. So that's the way that exercise works. Hopefully it should be pretty easy, kind of fun, be interesting to see where we land. The bottom part, the gray boxes, part two, what should our affordable housing goal be? And we're expressing it uh, for just so you understand the background. We're express, we've talked about it as a percentage. I mentioned our number right now is 8% of housing stock. The best, in the, and the best in the county in the North Bay is about 11.5%. The community housing committees, their recommendation is that we should be targeting 11 to 12%. There's a direct relationship between those percentages and how many units. So, for example, if you say we want to be 12%, we need to build 200 more housing, affordable housing units. The good news is 125 of those are in the pipeline through various things that have been going on for a long time. So we only have to figure out where the other 75 were going to come from. If there you, is the number of units in Washington. That's not, but Robert, we talked about this last time. That is not affordable housing. We'll talk about it later. Please, please, Robert, no, we're not going there. Um, so the... Um, it's, so if you say it's 11%, it's 165 units, and so you only have to build 40 more units. Okay, so put in the additional units that are required, and then you have to decide whether those are publicly built affordable units or privately built. And the privately built is driven by the market rate number that you've created. And then the really easy one is secondary dwelling units. So we've talked a lot about the value of secondary dwelling units. The community now has about 220 of those. If you do some quick math, you know, how, how many could we really build a year, over six years, how many would that create? Just kind of fill that box in. So the idea is to fill all of that out. The, um, the thing that's important, so on this sheet, at the end of the evening, you will fill out the total new market rate housing units, the total new middle income housing units, the total additional affordable housing units, and the total secondary dwelling units. So fill all of that. And then on the right-hand side, you can just talk about the types of products you'd like to see built. And there is a box there for other, because we have not have, there may be some that you would like to see built that aren't on this list. There are, uh, same thing for the uh, middle income, what would you like to see? And then for the affordable, you need to put the total public cost. So that's basically taking your blue M&Ms and multiplying it by $165,000, which is the cost that the legislative analyst's office has kind of defined as what it costs to build an affordable housing unit, not including land in California. So at the end of the night, a little bit of a reality check. We'll see how many affordable housing units, what's the public's responsibility, and what's that going to cost. And then you can, if you have time, you have a good conversation, maybe list some ideas of how that might be funded. So that would be kind of the final. You get extra points for that. You get an extra sandwich to take with you if you get that right. Okay, we got one, time for one or two questions, then I really want to get to the exercise. Yes? It is, um, it's actually in that centerfold of that little brochure, gives you an idea, but it's roughly a third, a third, a third. Third in the affordable, a third in the middle, and a third at, the mar at what would be the so-called market rate categories. Any other procedural questions? Okay. Oh, yep.
Yeah, no, nothing like that. Yep. Right. So, please, <laughs> another, not another variable. Okay, uh, we are gonna. So we're gonna try and do this. We're, we're obviously running a little bit long. Hopefully that was helpful. We um, will uh, convene. I'll, we'll do a check-in in about 40 minutes and see how everybody's doing. So what I'd suggest. Identify a reporter, identify a recorder, get going if you want to grab some coffee, but please have fun. You've got your M&Ms. Any questions, a number of us will be roaming around to try and answer, so get rolling. What we're going to do is we're going to go around table by table. I'm going to ask you for some of the key numbers that you came to in your group. And then um, I'd also like to so think about this, whoever your reporter is, what was the most interesting or challenging part of the conversation? Not challenging part of the exercise, but most interesting or challenging part of the conversation. Kind of what did you learn through this process? So numbers, what did you learn? And then we're going to finish with one more polling. So make sure you still have your little polling device. And then when you're done, leave the device on the table. Don't take it home, please. So, OK, so two minutes we're going to start. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you for your market rate number, your middle income number, your affordable public number, and your affordable private number. Please keep your sheets, because we're going to want to collect those, and we'll get the finer grained information. But just in the interest of time, I really don't want to have to everybody read through everything, because it probably will take a while. But So we'll go through those four numbers. And then I want you to give us an, an aha or a big question that you had out of your mind, OK? Okay, Jim. Um, so, so you want to ask the questions and I'll give you the answers because I can't. One thirty-five. We we felt a fifty-fifty split. Well, we cheated there because we feel that some of the privately af built affordable housing should come. We, we cheated because we felt that some of the privately built affordable housing should come from non-residential developers, okay. and that wasn't on the chart. So we, we felt that um, the, the vast bulk of the affordable housing should come from privately funded, either commercial or residential. Okay, so and so what was that number? That was 70. 70, and then how many public? Um, we had 15. 15. So you actually went over and above. Yes. And what was that 15 number? We were getting $2 million to $2 million five. Okay. And okay. we were trying to raise the money by the sale of existing public land and the transfer to more appropriate sites and a, some sort of transfer tax. So. Okay. All right, good. So you wrote all that down on your little notes, right? Yes, I did. Okay. So perfect example of what we want to hear from the other nine tables in terms of just level of information. Um, let's go over here. John, your table. Or whomever is going to do it. Okay. Hi. Um, so uh, market rate would be 135. Okay. Uh, middle income 135. Affordable housing um, private eight. Uh, sorry, 40. Okay. And public 20. 20. Yeah. Okay. And so that would be if I do my math correctly, that's like. Uh, 1.3 million, is that right? Did you do that math? Multiply it by 165 per unit? Oh, uh, no, we didn't. Didn't do not. that assignment. Okay. Sorry. We'll get, Jeff's going to do calculate Sorry. that for me. Yeah. And what was a big aha or what was an interesting part of the conversation? Um, it was uh, what is actually possible. <laughs> um, uh, it was, um, yeah, actually a big discussion uh, came about for the mixed use as a new product in the town and whether this was viable or not. 
and also the big aha was about the uh, Malta family, the five plus units, uh, what kind of mass and massing in the buildings you would be looking at and where they would even go. Okay. Um, even though it would be a quick solution. So it started shifting um, uh, around a lot more. And the cottage courts were, um, were a new product that would be nice to add into the mix. Okay, great. Let's keep can on going. Can I give my oh. aha real quickly? Uh, my frustration that this was so complex, we didn't really know, we weren't on top of it, and we rushed at the end, and so those numbers may look coherent, but I think in reality, we need to discuss it for about two hours to understand what the heck we just did. Okay, good. You need 165 times what number there? Uh, the tw 20. Should be 1.3. 3.3. 3.3, 3, yeah. Okay. All right, let's keep moving along. Next table. So, now, Colleen, uh, so your market rate number? So, we, where this is getting boring, 135 <laughs> and 135. <laughs> and Kay. then 13. Okay. And 50. And 50. And I think it was, uh, let's see, what do we calculate? Two. 2.5 million? For the, is that uh, right? Is it 13 times 6? 165. 165? Yeah. Okay. Something doesn't... Uh, I don't, don't do the math, please. Okay. 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 So we might have a little disconnect there on the market rate, but anyways, thank 2. you. 2.145. I was close. Okay. There you go. I rounded. And what was your big uh, point of conversation? Aha. Uh -huh. um, I think everyone at this table was feeling like this is not an achievable dream for them because of the amount of money they make at their jobs. They're realizing that they're going to have one person having to probably work two jobs, and it, it was just, I think it was kind of a sad discussion. A downer? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry they're about feel, that. feeling a little disheartened by what's going on, so. Okay. Well, let's see if we can fix that. Okay. Next table. Okay, your market yeah, rate number. 125 multi units. I'm sorry, 125? 125. Okay. Multi units. And okay. 65 of the five family multi units. 65 well, multi family five plus what, units. What was your split? Because we'll get, I'm sorry, we'll get the detail later. What was your split between market rate and missing middle? Your pink and your red. Okay. All right. So keep going. All right. So what was your affordable count? Affordable public? They're 75. But we're... we're all, pu all publicly built. You want 75 units publicly built. Okay. And what's that number, Bridget? I know you didn't do the math, but you got to do the math on this one. Okay. What's the math on that? What was it? 12 million. Okay. 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 No, that's great. Uh, any big ahas you want to share? Okay, well, there are no limits. But how many? How many did you set as a goal? Did you set a goal? No goal. Okay, all right. Let's they have 75. 75, okay. All right, let's keep going around. Michael Miller, Tucker Street, 26 years now. <laughs> Our total new market rate housing units was 125. Our total new middle income housing units was 145. Our total additional affordable housing units was 75. Um, for the public cost, oh, there was, would be 40 that would be publicly funded at 165000 each, and that's $6.6 .6 million. Our target was for total additional secondary units to be 75. Okay. 
And so you had 30, doing the math correctly, you had 35 privately built, which you derived from your 125, is that right? Correct. Okay, any big ahas? Um, no, we would like there to be, well, our big ahas was how can we come up with additional sources of funding for publicly funded um, homes? We know that you can get some from market rate housing. We're hoping there's other mechanisms that we can discuss in future meetings. Okay. Let's come around and maybe do the middle table here, Jeff. Yeah. Todd? Um, we came up with... Uh, uh, we came up with 80 uh, new uh, above market rate. Okay. 190 for the new middle. Okay. Uh, we had uh, for uh, public uh, 220 and private 25. Okay. And your number for the 220 was what? Uh, well, we're disputing your numbers that it seems like you've got it rigged here for, the, <laughs> for making it really hard. And we think that there are things that we can do to raise the money. Um, and so uh, we, we end up with 12 million okay. for, for the total amount, but we're look, getting creative. We're getting the city staff to really push the envelope. Okay, all right. Uh, the, well, the list of ways that we can do it is um, the TOT is going up, uh, so we would look at about 4% of the TOT being directed to affordable housing. Some of the V funds uh, make the Hillsburg a charter city. There's no downside to it. Instituted transfer tax is progressive so that people have houses that are uh, not that affordable. You know, rich are don't get taxed. You don't get the transfer tax. Right now, we have a 0.55 percent transfer tax. Santa Rosa and Petaluma have a two percent. San Francisco has a much higher percent. There's a we could raise 1.5 million uh, with that linkage fees, which we haven't done. Change the fee structure uh, so that it, uh, you know, is more uh, agreeable. And based on square footage, reduced building. Anyway, there are a lot of tools there. Okay. All right. Yeah, go over there. Um, okay. Oh, thanks. Um, total new market, uh, 108. Oh, okay. Uh, middle income, 163. Uh, privately or public is your next one, um, 59. And private, 16, 59 and 16. Okay. And uh, 100 was our number for secondary dwellings. Okay. And your did and you and uh, cost to uh, public was nine point seven three five. Okay. All right. Uh, let's come on up around this way, Jeff. Can, can I do the aha? Uh -huh? Oh yes, please. Uh, Pardon me. These are rental units. You don't have to give them away. What's you up? don't have to raise twelve million dollars and give it away. You build the houses. You rent them. You pay the loan back. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. The the rent won't necessarily always support the full loan, but you're but you're right. But there is an income stream. It's not a giveaway, right? Okay. You've been selected. I've I've been selected. Um. So I wish we had more time. Um. We uh, struggled a bit on 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 it, but um. We have some numbers. So total new market rate housing units was eighty five. Okay. Uh, total new middle income housing units was 185. Okay. Um, uh, total additional affordable units, 75. And how was that split between your blue and yellow M&Ms? Um, did, you, did you get that fine grain? Did we get that? So 30 and 45. So 30 blue and 45 yellow. Okay. Okay, that, so were you increasing the percentage that's coming off the market? Just to, cause you're, that's almost a 50% yield versus the 15% that the city has. Okay, we'll check that out. But anyways, um, aha. Um, ahas, anyone? No? Our total? Oh, so our total number was four million nine hundred and fifty thousand. Oh, okay. 
And then I think the discussion that we kind of got carried away with for a little bit was we um, discussed a little bit about the limits on multifamily units um, in terms of just volume and size. And then also whether or not um, developers would actually build multifamily units that were four units or less. Um, so just some, some things we discussed. Okay. Good. So we got two tables left. Thank you. Everybody's being really patient. Promise we're almost there. This table here. Good. So for uh, new market rate housing units, uh, 150. Okay. Total middle income housing units, 120. And in terms of housing types, we're pretty balanced across the board on both of those. Okay. Additional affordable housing units, 75, 20 of which would be privately paid for. And uh, the balance, the 55, would be public funded. And then our, ha our aha moment was around the uh, granny units or the uh, SDUs. And we're saying, uh, as we obviously, since we said 75 there, and we think there's a real opportunity by adjusting the fee structure and incenting people to build those, rather than today, you know, it's skewed, you're paying a premium to build a granny unit because the many of the fees are fixed. Right. Uh, I've, I've just personally examined this myself and had a bit of an aha moment, and, and I'm thinking about other people in town who might be house rich and cash poor. If they were incented to build a granny unit, they might be able to put their, their parents there or their, or their children who came back to the fold. Right. Um, let's see. Um, we could look at the tourist tax and maybe uh, increase that a tad. Uh, Building new McMansions, for lack of a better term, might pay a premium tax. Mm -hmm. uh, funding through non-residential uh, construction, which I think was already mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, Healdsburg could also establish the first private lottery inside of California <laughs> to... Uh, <laughs> okay. Right. We, uh, we, we also thought that, uh, and I don't think we heard this yet, tiny houses could be an interesting option for right. some folks. And um, I think we've covered everything. We talked about less fees for the secondary units. Okay, it. good. Very good. Okay, we're going to come to our last table. Just a quick reminder, because uh, some people may trickle out. Exit surveys, if you can, please do those. We need your worksheets. So we have all of the subtext and the numbers and stuff that you put together so we can get that properly. Um, hang on. we got one more table, Todd. Uh, so I just want to, while we're doing this last table, and then we are going to do one final polling um, assignment, and then we will be done. So again, thanks for your patience. All right, final table. Okay, ready? Is Joe. This thing on? <clears throat> Numbers, market rate? 160. Okay. Missing middle? 110. 110. Right? I can still do my math. All right, good. For affordable? Uh, 50 public, 25 pi private. Okay. What was your aha? Um, aha, so we, uh, how complex it was, I guess. Um, it was it was it was probably the big, the, the real big aha. Is there anything else to say about that? Yeah, well, our leadership can help in this process. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay, great uh, close on that. Um, oh, one yeah. other thing, you, uh, just doing a, a quick math of, of of how to pay for the the yeah. public. You know, uh, if you figure on eight and eight million, eight point two million, right? Um, Dividing that between uh, some, some of the single family detached and the uh, and the and the reds, I mean, it comes out to like one thirty seven five hundred per single family detached. And if and if you're talking about like a, a large you know you know market rate single family, it's not a huge percentage of a like if you're talking about like a multi million like a it might be a ten percent fee. So you're saying as a as a, a surcharge almost on right. the price of the home, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then thirty one thousand. And then for the rest of the of those uh, types, thirty one thousand fees. So I mean, I I, I don't want to get into the math, but I mean, it seems like doable to pay for that with some not unreasonable fees. Okay, good. Okay, um, Marilyn? Uh, we left out a number. Okay. Like it's about 1,200 on the uh, secondary dwelling units. Is that you right here? Yeah, that's me. Okay, how many? In the next six years. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, 
Okay. And were you right here, Canada? 75? Okay. All right. Again, we'll get your tables, um, and we're going to do, okay, so get your little clickers out. I'm going to take Mel's question, but we're going to get ready for our final polling, then we'll be done. Mel. Column number six, that's $36 million, not 12. Number six. Yeah, 220 units. Oh, 12, uh, $36 million? Yes. Okay. Public funds. Okay. So... I realize uh, this was complex, it was hard, it was a lot of moving parts. Uh, welcome to the world of trying to solve the housing problem in Healdsburg. Those that sit on the committee realize, you know, they know how difficult this is. Hopefully you got a glimpse of it. It's not to say, again, it's not unsolvable, but it is a very complex set of issues. Um, the goal was not to get to a single number that we all agreed on, but to try and find you know, is there some bans? Do people start to understand the trade-offs that have to be made? And more importantly, it sounds like there were some really good ideas about how we could creatively fund and maybe close that gap that's out there. So there are a lot of good ideas there. All right, we're going to go. Uh, everybody got their clicker. We're going to do one final polling. I think we are. Okay. All right. So can you kill the lights? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to put it both ways because um, that's that's a bit of the exercise. Is it was the cost, not how it was funded, but it's the cost. So it's it may not cost. It's going to cost. Okay. All right. All right. Good. Well, we'll 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 adjust that. But um, okay. So let's go. What we want to do is. Um, go back through the objectives based on what we talked about tonight and see if there's been, you know, if you learned anything through this process, it might give you a little different way of thinking about what the priorities should be. So uh, the priorities that we have, and again, you're going to click these by numbers. First one, increase, so this is the top priority. So what should be the top priority within the housing action plan for the next six years for Healdsburg? Okay, it's not long term. This is just the next six years, our housing action plan. Increase the quantity and quality of deed-restricted affordable housing. Incentivize development of new market rate rental units. Incentivize development of new seniors. Encourage, facilitate, and incentivize creative density housing, which means, you know, different kind of products that maybe use land a little more efficiently. Develop new deed-restricted middle-income housing. Encourage, facilitate, and incentivize the development of secondary dwelling units. Encourage appropriately scaled and well-designed products. Site and build affordable housing close to existing services. And address the impact of second home ownership on stock. So again, it doesn't mean that you don't care about all of these things, but what do you think is the number one thing we should be trying to achieve with our housing action plan over the next six years? Okay, there we go. Okay, it's probably may toggle a little bit there, but I think we have we have a few less people. I think we were up to 70 before, so we've had some people attrition. Uh, but it hasn't changed in terms of the number one priority being the development of uh, quantity and quality of deed-restricted affordable housing. The second one, the one, you know, obviously lagging behind there, but still an own, uh, encourage and facilitate and incentivize a creative density housing. So the idea of whether it's multifamily or it's cottage court or it's mixed use live work kind of thing. So that's a good, uh, good one. And then um, uh, interesting, the, the next one would be site and build affordable housing proximate to existing services. So, okay, very good. Thank you all for coming tonight. Please do the exit survey. Um, and I appreciate you all staying. We tried to keep this to two hours, obviously a difficult task, but hopefully we got you out of here relatively quickly. So thank you. <laughs>